In uh, <clears throat> writing a spiritual solution to every problem, I'm suggesting to you that uh, there is another way to even begin to look at all of this from the perspective of yourself as an infinite soul. And the problem then no longer becomes something that you are living with in agony and pain and suffering and creating all of the diseases of your life, but it becomes a clarion call to bring the world closer to God. Coming to know God, Japa meditation is one of ways to come to know God. There are many others. In reading the aphorisms of Patanjali, he was talking, now you have to remember, we're talking about before the Middle Ages, which were called the Dark Ages. And here was Patanjali writing about the ability to be able to do absolutely miraculous things. The ability to be able to be in more than one place at the same time. The ability to be able to be in the presence of another human being and raise your energy to such a level that you could literally, by your presence alone, just heal that person. The ability to be able to transcend things like diseases. The ability to be able to have the gift of fish and loaves. To just live at such a level of consciousness that anything you placed your attention on instantaneously, you had the capacity and the power to be able to make that realization for you. Out of these teachings, the basic principles for a spiritual solution to every problem evolved for me. There were many. The book is called uh, How to Know God. Now, it's not called How to Know About God. It's not called How to Believe in God. It's called How to Know God. And How to Know God means making conscious contact with God. It's the only way you can know anything. How do you know how to ride a bicycle? Because you've been on one. Not because somebody else has given you their testimony. Not because you've watched other people do it or you've listened to other people telling you that it's possible. Those are all approaching knowing. Knowing God means, or knowing bicycle riding, or knowing swimming means getting in the water, getting on the bike, slipping around, getting your head wet, perhaps swallowing some water, falling a few times, and eventually having that knowing. And even though many of you haven't been on a bicycle for 20 years or more, if I put one in here and you were on one when you were five, you would get on it with a knowing and you would ride off. But if you haven't been on one, you would have questions about whether it's possible, and I don't know, that little seat, and look at the size of my seat, and uh, those little tiny tires, and you would have all kinds of questions until you have the knowing. And so, what I want to share with you in these uh, remaining moments here is five of these aphorisms. Now, I came across something from How to Know God. And it was the most, it was for me for years and still is, one of the most significant pieces of writing in terms of its impact on creating a spiritual solution to problems that I've ever heard. He said, when you are inspired, and inspired, of course, means what? In spirit. As opposed to being in form. When you're in form, what do you get? Informed or information. When you're in spirit, you get inspiration. And there's no shortage of information. This has been called the information age. I'm about trying to move us into the inspiration age. Because it's a deficit of spirit that creates all of these illusions that we call problems in our world, collectively and individually. And he put it this way. He said, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all of your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction. And you find yourself in a new and a great and a wonderful world. And then the part that always gets to me, he said, dormant forces, faculties and talents come alive. That when you become inspired, these dormant forces come alive. And here are the aphorisms. There are five of them that I picked 
as the most significant ones for you to grasp as we move into these frequencies of higher awareness called spiritual consciousness and how you can identify them and see how they work in your life which are coming up. By the way, Rumi wrote these words about who can do this. He said, come. Come whoever you are. Wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come even if you have broken your vows a hundred times, a thousand times. Come, come, come again and again. Isn't that beautiful? That, that whole idea that it's like, just because you've had failures and you haven't, it hasn't worked or you've broken your, just keep, this is not a caravan of despair. Where there is despair, St. Francis said, what? Let me bring hope, hope. So here are the five aphorisms, very quickly. And I'm not going to go into a great detail on them now because they will become self-explanatory this afternoon. The first is called, the central act of ignorance is false identification. The central act of ignorance is called false identification. What does Patanjali mean by false identification? And what does he mean by ignorance? Ignorance is not to be assumed to mean that you are uninformed. It means that you are identifying yourself as a human being with your body and your possessions and this material world. And the central act of that ignorance is the identification falsely with this world of the changing. But beyond the world of the changing is the changeless world. And once you start to identify yourself there and know that this is who you are, know it, like you're listening right now and you're watching and the energy that is coming into you is coming through your eyes and ears and senses. And it is only your eyes and your ears and your senses that take this energy and twist it into something called evil or problems. It comes into your eyes, these, these energies, and into your ears if it could be examined just before it hits your eyes and just before it reaches your ears, and we could examine it very carefully, you would find that the scientists would say, no, there's no problems in that energy. There's no evil in that energy. No, it's just energy. It's just a frequency that's vibrating at a certain speed. But as soon as it hits your senses and you begin to interpret it, problems begin to show up in your life. But the energy itself contains no problems. It's just energy. That's proper identification according to Patanjali. That's the first aphorism. The second aphorism sounds like this. The mind of the truly illumined, said Patanjali, is calm because the peace of God within all things is known, even within the appearance of misery and disease. Even within the appearance of misery and disease. The mind of the truly illumined is always calm. And this is a reference that Patanjali made that really struck me. He said, God cannot express God's self in you when you are not at peace. If you're not at peace, at any moment in your life, you have sent God out of your life and God can't express God's self in you. And the mind of the truly illumined understands that the peace of God is in all things. And of course in miracles there's this wonderful line. Again, I have this on my office where I look at it every day. There is a way of living in the world, says the Course, that is not here. Although it seems to be. You do not change appearance though you smile more frequently. Your forehead is serene, your eyes are quiet, and the ones who walk the world as you do recognize their own. Yet those who have not yet perceived the way will recognize you also and believe that you are like them as you were before. That gives me goose flesh. 
every time I read it, and I've read it a thousand times at least. There's a way of living in the world that is not here, although it seems to be. This is who Jesus was. You are in this world, but what? You are not of this world. That is not who you are. You are not of this world, even though you're in it. So you're filling out the forms. You send in your money to the IRS. And you stop at the red lights. And you obey the laws. And you follow the rules, that is most of them, which seem to make sense. And the ones that don't, you're able to ignore. Which you have to. Otherwise, we'll never have any growth. Otherwise, you know, when my mother was born, my own mother was born, and she's alive today, women couldn't vote in this country. That was the law. Somebody had to say, we have to disregard this, the laws that don't make sense. Somebody has to do that. But you're in the world, and so you're what my friend Stuart Wilde calls a fringe dweller. You sort of dwell on the fringe. But you know that there's a deeper and a richer experience of life, and it's available to you, and you're going to have it. So that's the second aphorism. The peace of God is in everything, even what it appears not to be. The third aphorism is quite simple, and it's one that's most troubling to many people in the West. Patanjali said, sin is non-existent. Sin is non-existent. There are only obstacles to one's ultimate union with God. You do not sin. When you behave toward another person in a harmful way, when you steal from another person, when you do any, violate any of the commandments or whatever, you have not sinned. You have created an obstacle to your union with God. And it is in the recognition that I now have this obstacle and I've got to deal with this obstacle and it's present there and I will eliminate that obstacle from my life. Is another way. You see, the reason we don't want to put sin in there, according to Patanjali, is because it creates shame and guilt. Shame computes the absolute lowest in uh, whether you're going to be strong or weak in your life. Shame is the lowest frequency emotion that is possible. It only computes at 25 on a scale of 1 to 1,000. The fourth aphorism that leads us into a spiritual solution to every problem sounds like this. And these last two are the ones that I absolutely resonate to and love the most. The person who is steadfast in his abstention from falsehood has the power to obtain for himself and others the fruits of good deeds without having to perform the deeds themselves. Steadfast in abstaining from means that you never waver and you never have thoughts of falsehood, that is, identifying yourself as a material being rather than a spiritual being. And when you become steadfast in that, when you say to someone, God blesses you, they are blessed by your presence when you have that kind of consciousness. And you present yourself to someone and you are absolutely steadfast in abstention from falsehood. And in the presence of such a person, healing takes place. And blessing takes place. And that's all you have to do to become someone who performs these spiritual miracles. And the fifth aphorism, my favorite of all, says, When a person is steadfast in his abstention from harming others, then all living creatures will cease to feel enmity in his or her presence. Let me give it to you again. When a person becomes steadfast in their abstention from thoughts of harming others, all living creatures will cease to feel enmity in their presence. Pain, hatred. That was St. Francis. It wasn't that he most of the time didn't have thoughts of anger and hatred toward other people. He never had them. 
When this Agadatu was asked, what's the difference between saints and the rest of us? Is it that they have unconditional love and we don't in them? He said, no. You have unconditional love in you and so do the saints. He said, the only difference between you and the saints is that they have nothing else inside of them to give away. So when you become steadfast in your abstention from ever having a thought of harm directing at other people, and that's how you walk through the world, butterflies will land on your shoulder. Birds will not be afraid of you. Little dogs or even vicious dogs will become domesticated by being in your presence. All living creatures, babies, will goo-goo and come to you. You know people like this, don't you? There are some people, particularly children, but there are some people who in their presence, because they never have a thought that is directed of anger or judgment or hatred toward another, no one feels enmity in their presence. It's absolutely astonishing. And if you read Kostanzakis' St. Francis, you'll see that that was his life from the 24th of September, a Sunday, in the year 1206 when he had his revelation, when he was spoken to and gave up all of his worldly possessions. And for the next 20 years of his life, until he was 45 when he died, he ceased to have thoughts of harm directed at anyone, particularly his father who rejected him and his mother who was in deep pain and all of the people including the sultans when he went to the Crusades and tried to convince the Christians not to murder the Muslims, and when he went to Pope Innocent III and asked for his blessing in confirming his order, and was willing to walk through the fire to prove his connection to God if the Pope would follow him into the fire. I will walk in there and not be burned. And St. Francis was able to do those things. And the Pope got very nervous. And what you'll do is set into motion these dormant forces which will collaborate with you because you're in spirit rather than in form.